Welcome to Geographics. I'm your co-host Eric Malachite, resident cosmic horror author and weirdo, and today's video is about the fossil forest of Joggins, written by Quentin Burns. This is a bit of an experimental video, as the script is quite story-centric. I warn you, however, that Quentin's script is quite hypnotizing. I hope it draws you in the way it drew us in. The Mi'kmaq called the area Chagogan, the place of the fishing weirs. Chagogan became the Joggins to the English, then the South Joggins, and finally, Joggins. This form of haunting is common among place names in Nova Scotia. The original name lies curled inside the shape of the new one at once destroyed and preserved. Today, Joggins is a tiny village on the western coast of Nova Scotia, Canada. 315 million years ago, it was an equatorial forest whose ghost would profoundly affect the emerging science of paleontology. The cliffs below Joggins are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Dr. John Calder, who was instrumental in securing that recognition, calls them the storybook of the Coal Age. It is a book to be read in wonder, but not lightly. To Calder, the cliffs hold great lessons for us about our shared past and our future together on this changing earth. Here and there, embedded high in the face of the cliffs, are what appear to be Grecian columns. The columns are the trunks of fossilized lycopsid trees, kings of the Coal Age forests. Within the layers of rock, sixty ancient forests are still standing. Their trees are upright and hollow, their stone roots reaching deeper than in life. Small creatures are entombed inside the trees, some of the earliest land-dwelling vertebrates. One is Hylonymus yeli, the first reptile in the fossil record. After 315 million years in darkness, erosion is pulling them all back into the light. The first hollow tree creatures were discovered in 1852 by the famous Scottish geologist Sir Charles Lyell and his colleague, Canadian paleontologist Sir William Dawson. But you might equally say that the creatures discovered them by crashing down onto the beach at the right time. In the storybook of the Coal Age, the swamp forest is a temple to itself. The lycopsid columns of the temple stand a meter thick and thirty high, decorated in elaborate and delicate geometrics. Some of them branch symmetrically at their crowns, making vaults. The roof of the temple is a distant canopy of needles and cones, shaping strange windows out of the sky. Many fossil forests already sleep in the rock beneath this one, but Helonymus knows nothing of that. Helonymus is lithe, fast, and sharp-toothed. This is what it knows. It is a four-legged vertebrae, five-toed, twenty centimeters long. It skitters through a carpet of ferns. There is no grass, not for another 250 million years. There are no birds or mammals. There are palm-sized spiders, giant dragonflies, and two-meter-long millipedes. Invertebrates grow monstrous here in the oxygen-heavy air, and lightning strikes catch fire instantly. When the fires roll through, Helonymus knows where to go. Its den is an inner sanctum of the forest temple, a hollow lycopsid, the door carved by fire. The flames reach in again, but when the fire passes, Helonymus is safe. One day, days or years from now, Helonymus will not leave its den. The hollow tree will fill with earth and turn to stone, and they will be interred together in the great mausoleum beneath the forest temple. 315 million years later, Sir Charles Lyell will go looking for them. He won't know he is looking for Helonymus. He's looking for the answer to Cole. He's looking to prove himself right about deep time and to prove Charles Darwin wrong about evolution. When Lyle's boat approaches the cliffs of Chagogan in 1842, he will see the great book opening before him. The cliffs appear as a 15 kilometer long stack of pages, leaning 20 degrees against the side of a shelf. Every page is a layer of sedimentary rock, vibrant and distinct. Sandstone, siltstone, mudstone, limestone, and coal. At the base of the cliffs, the sandstone layers extend outward into the bay, forming a series of massive intertidal reefs. At low tide, the Book of Cliffs can be seen with its pages open, inviting itself to be read. In a letter to his sister, Lyle will call it the most wonderful phenomenon that I have seen. Before it was an open book, Joggins was a buried ream of pages, a thick stack of sedimentary rock beds. The ream became a book at the end of the last ice age around 13,000 years ago, when a glacier retreated from the former shore. The long, compressed earth sprang upwards, 
and the cliffs rose. Since the exposed layers tilt to the south, when you walk north along the cliffs, you are walking backward in time. At Ragged Reef, the southern point of the World Heritage Site, the layers are 310 million years old. At Downing Cove, the northern point, they are 325 million years old. In 15 kilometers of beach, you walk 15 million years. Once this slice of time was exposed, the tides took a cudgel to it. Tides along the Joggins coast are the most extreme in the world. Every day the shoreline rises and falls 16 meters, as 100 billion tons of water move in and out of the Bay of Fundy. Under this barrage, the cliffs are continuously reshaped. Large sections fall regularly along fault lines chiseled by the harsh frosts and thaws of Nova Scotian winters. New trees are revealed before crashing down onto shore. Old mine workings are exposed, tunnels into another dark past. The water takes away newly fallen rocks and fossils, burying them or destroying them. As it buries, it unburies. Every day there is the possibility of a new breakthrough discovery. Every day something is lost forever, never to be known. The past is frozen, unchanging, but our path through the past is ever-changing and looks different all the time. At the north end of the beach, the cliffs are tan and sandy. To the south, they are jagged and gray, shot with coal. This boundary marks a worldwide change in climate, one that splits our category of the Carboniferous Age in two. During the early Carboniferous, the future shores of Africa and North America crashed against each other. They raised the Appalachian Mountains and the highlands of Nova Scotia and Scotland. Huge rivers flowed down from the new mountains, washing in sand and far-flung fossils, creating the sandstone layers at the older end of the beach. Plant fossils from the early Carboniferous lack growth rings, suggesting indistinct seasons. The climate was hot, humid, and globally consistent. The shifting continents created more land, which was alternately flooded and dry. These were the perfect conditions for Lycopsid swamp forests to spread across Europe and North America, and the perfect conditions to make coal. The plants took carbon dioxide out of the air, using it to create their substance. Dead plant matter built up as peat, still storing carbon, and didn't fully decay. Compress the peat for a few millennia, and you have coal beds. As plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they put oxygen into it. In the late Carboniferous, oxygen concentration rose higher than ever, 50% higher than today. A high oxygen, low carbon dioxide atmosphere had the effect of cooling the Earth, the opposite of the greenhouse effect we see now. Temperatures became milder, and the South Pole froze. At Joggins, the topography changed from drylands to wetlands, and the swamp forest began to grow. The Book of Joggins shows layer by layer and year by year how the change happened. As you follow the cliffs south, thin beds of coal start to appear. Over time, they get thicker and thicker, eventually thick enough to be mined. Over 67 beds of coal are exposed at Joggins, and sandwiched therein are the 60 forests. The picture of gradual change over time is exactly what Lyle was hoping to find at Joggins. Lyle was the world's leading proponent of the theory of gradualism, which held that Earth's timeline was vast and the planet had changed extremely slowly. The competing theory, catastrophism, said the Earth had only been altered over time by rare, momentous events. The story of gradualism versus catastrophism starts half a century earlier, when a worldview-breaking idea was added to our understanding of species, the idea of extinction. In 1787, giant mystery bones were discovered in America and fancifully interpreted into an elephant-like creature six times its size. It had the claws of a giant sloth, the grace of a tiger and tusks on top of its head. It was called incognitum. No one could agree what it looked like, but it definitely wasn't around anymore. In 1796, hotshot paleontologist Georges Cuvier wrote a paper describing, for the first time, a theory of extinctions. He put the blame on forgotten global catastrophes. Extinctions sat badly with the dominant Christian worldview of the time. Life was supposed to be here for a reason. Why had the incognitum been made only to be destroyed? It seemed too casual, too purposeless. When the American President Jefferson sent an expedition to explore America's interior, he was hoping his scientists would find herds of mastodons somewhere and prove extinction wrong. Over the next 50 years, a schism emerged in paleontology, catastrophists versus gradualists. 
Catastrophists believed events like the Biblical Flood had ended species, leveled mountains, and changed the world by large steps. Gradualists held that the Earth changed very slowly, and that being the case, that it must have happened over a vast period of time. Lyle became gradualism's biggest champion. He believed the present is key to the past, that whatever happened back then is still happening now. He looked for evidence that the Earth was shaped and reshaped by the same familiar rivers and tides, the same forces of erosion and decay that we see all around us. He found that evidence at Joggins. A layer of sediment is a layer of tiny particles. The particles were moved into place by flowing water, then they settled and solidified. Therefore, each layer records an event that moved sediment into place. The layers have different features depending on the size and type of particles that form them, and the nature of the moving water. By looking at the features of a layer, we can make a guess about the event that caused it and what span of time it represents. Look at the layers that contain buried trees. How did the trees get buried, and how long did it take? A buried trunk is encased in many thin, alternating layers of sandstone and mudstone. The sandstone layers have a sharply defined base and a top that graduates into the next mudstone layer. The pattern is what we see in climates with seasonal flooding. Floodwaters move sand into place, and the large particles settle quickly. Smaller mud particles settle more gradually on top of the sand. We don't know how frequently the Joggins Swamp flooded, but assuming at least one flood per year, we can speculate that a 4 meter trunk was buried in less than 40 years. When separated, the layers of sediment can be read. The fossilized footprints and trails of coal age creatures show us how they lived. A heavy amphibian twisted its feet as it walked pulling them out of the sticky swamp mud. A smaller tetrapod dug its claws in. Something huge and many-legged left trails like truck tires. We can compare the fossil tracks to the tracks of modern animals to imagine how they moved and behaved. Impressions of strangely patterned bark and intricate fern leaves are abundant. Fossil tetrapod bones are relatively rare. A tetrapod is a land-dwelling amphibian or reptile. 19 species have been discovered at Joggins, from the size of a salamander to the size of an iguana. 315 million years after they lived, a few of these tetrapods became famous. The hollow tree creatures, as they were called, are the iconic discovery at Joggins. Fossil bones interred inside the fossil lycopsid trees. Dawson collected hollow tree creatures at Joggins for decades, at one point blasting apart a reef to expose 25 trees. Fifteen were occupied. One of his discoveries, Helonymus Yelly, would later come to be recognized as the first reptile in the fossil record. He named it after Lyle, Lyle's forest dweller. Charles Darwin found evidence for evolution in the Joggins discoveries. Lyle and Dawson, on the other hand, found the opposite. Lyle's picture of gradual change over time had inspired Darwin to develop his theory of evolution. Lyle was unimpressed. He thought evolution was able to appear temporarily credible because of how incomplete the fossil record was. Eventually, he was sure they would find evidence of higher life forms far back in the past. When the first hollow tree tetrapod was found, Lyle took it as a win for gradualism and a blow to evolution. Dawson believed evolution contradicted his own observations at Joggins. He knew that some fossils were present and unchanged across millions of years. Nowhere in evidence was this slow, gradual shifting of form. He wrote, We thus see that evolution as a hypothesis has no basis in experience or in scientific fact, and that its imagined series of transmutations has breaks which cannot be filled. Dawson's observation was true, even if his conclusion was not. We now consider that evolution can happen in short bursts with long stagnations. Darwin had anticipated objections on the grounds of insufficient fossil evidence, and on the origin of species he used Joggins as an example against these objections. Joggins was put forward as the most complete site of its kind. Because we can see how wonderfully complete it is, we can also see how much is missing. Many forests were preserved, but most were not. During the times between, those forests were still living. Most of what lives will never be preserved as a fossil. Finding fossils that unquestionably show evolution is nigh on impossible, and cannot be taken as a requirement to accept the theory. It is easy to take knowledge for granted, 
but things we know today as facts were once discoveries and theories. Once you have an answer to something, the evidence seems to point there. Before you have an answer, it points everywhere, anywhere, and nowhere. It may point towards wrong answers as easily as right ones. All of which is to say Darwin did not know what coal was. He argued fervently about it with several esteemed scientists, including Lyle. In one letter to a friend, he furiously exclaimed, I suppose coal was rained down to puzzle mortals. Darwin thought coal beds came from carpets of ancient marine plant life on the sea floor. Lyle and Dawson thought coal formed on land. That idea was the one that first drew Lyle to Joggins in 1842 after reading a geological description by a Nova Scotian coal mine manager. Lyle wrote, The first allusion to the trees which I have met with is that published in 1829 by Mr. Richard Brown. In Halliburton's Nova Scotia, I felt convinced that if I could verify the accounts of which I had read, of the superposition of so many different tiers of trees, each representing forests which grew in succession on the same area, one above the other, and if I could prove at the same time their connection with seams of coal, it would go farther than any facts yet recorded to confirm the theory that coal in general is derived from vegetables produced on the spots where the carbonaceous matter is now stored up in the earth. As it happened, he was right about coal, and he was right that Joggins proved it, at least to Darwin's satisfaction. Calder calls the Coal Age Act One of a two-act play. When Mr. Brown wrote the description that drew Lyle to Joggins, it was an early scene in the second act. The fossils at Joggins were found because of the search for coal, because of miners scuttling past ancient tetrapods in the dark. They were there for the Industrial Revolution, there to keep the fires burning, there to reshape the fate of the world by the simple action of making a livelihood. Now, we are well into the second act of the play. The carbon that was long ago stored in the earth by carboniferous forests is being released, changing the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The greenhouse blanket is going back on the earth. Lyle said the present is key to the past. The past, in turn, may be the key to the present. By understanding the history of the earth, we change our understanding of current reality and can act upon that understanding. At Joggins, we see a story of life forms profoundly changing the Earth's atmosphere, altering the course of millennia. We see the immense consequences of carbon and oxygen. Calder urges us to read it as a warning. <laughs> The Joggins scient has played a role in debates of significance to humanity, debates about the age of the Earth, the nature of geological and biological change over time, the relationship between the past and the present. There are a few smaller debates to bring up concerning Hellonymus. First, was it a reptile? Modern reptiles are scaly. They have some common features of the skull and vertebrae. They reproduce internally and their embryos develop in fluid-filled amniotic sacs. At the time of Hellonymus, early reptiles and amphibians were still distinguishing themselves. The reptile was learning to take the sea with it, its skin becoming more waterproof. The hard-shelled egg, a portable sea you can lay anywhere, is usually cast as the definitive step toward reptilian independence. No fossil eggs have ever been found at Joggins. A recent study has called the essentiality of the egg into doubt, suggesting that early reptiles might have been able to bear live young. The definition of reptile has changed several times. What we really want to know by, is it a reptile, is where does it fit on the tree of life? How are we related to each other? A hundred years after Hellonymus was found, paleontologist Robert Carroll officially granted its status of the reptile class. It may be the earliest member of one of the three main branches of reptile, but those branches are still hotly contested. The second debate about Hellonymus is, what was it doing in the Lycopsid? When Lyle and Dawson first presented their discovery of the hollow tree creatures, they offered three theories about how the creatures got into the trees. One, they used hollow Lycopsids as dens. Two, they were washed in by flood waters. Three, they fell into pits created by the hollow buried trees and were trapped there to death. Dawson favored the pitfall theory. Calder calls the inclination towards pitfall theory a human-centric Victorian view of nature, casting animals as hapless victims of their environment. He argues for dens. The creatures are found in the base of the trees, beneath the sediment that washed in later. They are usually found with fossil feces, so they were alive inside the trees for some time. They are always found with fossil charcoal so fire was always involved. The fire scars on the Lycopsids could have made for points of entry. 
In the Victorian view of nature, humans stand alone among the animals. Humans act with reason. Humans bring the coal fires of the Industrial Revolution, the fires of progress, the fires of enlightenment and advancement. It is for humans to read and interpret the Book of Time. We are the active agents on the inactive subject of the past, which stands long frozen in stone. Joggins puts the passivity of the ancient past into question. The present is the key to the past, but the past is still happening to the present. Modern creatures make their dens in trees. Then again, modern creatures fall prey to pit traps. The present may be the key to the past, but it doesn't offer an interpretation. If Helonymus made tree dens, it was among the very first vertebrates to do so. Perhaps Helonymus was our first ancestor to live in a wooden house, or to take sanctuary in a sanctum, our first ancestor to be entombed in a mausoleum. Fire carved the door to its den temple tomb. Fire was there at the start, in the first act of Calder's two-act play. Fire, water, coal. These familiar forces shaped our world in familiar ways then and now. The two acts, which meet each other at the Cliffs of Joggins, have parallel structure and shared characters. They star life forms as agents of powerful change, capable of profoundly affecting the world just by living, gradually and catastrophically. Well, I hope you found this video to be equal parts informative and entertaining. Let us know in the comments what you thought of the tone and mood of this one, and whether or not you'd like to see more story-focused videos like this in the future. And of course, you can follow myself and Quentin by clicking the links in the description and pinned comment. I've been your host, Eric Malachite. Make sure you do all that algorithmic jazz, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.